so much for singing. You can have a seat. Thank you, Charles, so much. Good to see you all this morning, church. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, before we get any farther into the service, I do want to share with you something that maybe, maybe is obvious because of our first um, worship song, but I want to reintroduce to you Charles Harnack this morning. All right? And, um, I, uh, I, I so much, in, in so many ways, I feel as if Charles is a member of our church family because he is. And, you know, whether he's here in person or we just see each other along the way, uh, you're very much a part of our family, Charles. And so Charles has agreed to come on board and to serve out as our, we're just going to call, we're going to say interim worship leader, all right, for the next season. So, I mean, Lord willing, uh, certainly till uh, the end of the year, through all of the holidays and all of that, and then, and then perhaps after that as well. We'll see. I say we'll see because we are going to begin our search for a worship leader for our church family. We'll keep you updated and, and posted along the way, but as of right now, for the immediate future, Charles has already met with the choir Wednesday night, and they had their first rehearsal, and of course, starts today uh, leading us in worship. That's the plans for the near future, Lord willing, and then we'll keep you posted as we go. So thank you again, Charles, so much for being willing to serve, you know. And just, I just appreciate so much your, your uh, servant spirit. It really is genuine, and I'm thankful for that. Now, a couple of things for our church family. You know, on Sunday mornings as we worship together, as important and meaningful as this time is, our church... We, we are active all the time. And so I just want you sometime today, if you would, to take a few minutes and, and reacquaint yourself with the different ministries that are going on week in, week out here in not only in our community, but literally to the uttermost parts of the world. Like the, um, the announcement there and note about Operation Christmas Child, that's, that's part of that global ministry to the nations and then the the one on uh, fall the fall festival which is going to be on sunday october the 30th that's to our neighbors and so whether it's reaching out to our neighbors or the nations this ministry is ongoing we celebrate what god's doing and we certainly uh, give him the worship and the honor that he's due and worthy of on the first day of the week on the Lord's Day, but that's kind of a first fruits, you know, for the rest of the week, just as we give out of our, what God, what God blesses us with, out of the, the income that he provides or the, the wealth that he gives to us, we take the first fruits of that in the form of, of tithes, and then we give offerings, but it, that represents a total that he, you know, continues to give into our lives, and our uh, the, the stewardship of our time is similar. So one of the reasons that we worship as we do together on the first day of the week is because it, it celebrates that the resurrection of Jesus was on the first day of the week, that, that Sunday morning. But it also is a way for us to provide the first fruits of our week. So just as we don't give out of our um, income the leftovers, we, don't, we shouldn't give God the leftovers of our time either, should we? So we start our week... This is not the week, we consider it the weekend, sort of, but in the Christian church, this is the beginning of, a, of another week, and it, but it represents what ought to be a life of worship throughout the week. So, speaking of tithes and offerings, as always, to continue to do that, you can do it as many of you all do through your Sunday school and Bible study time. You can do it by going online and giving in that way, in a secure way. Or you can drop it in the baskets as you come in or leave that are at the exits. Any of those is, of course, fine. Um, but please do take a few minutes and just notice these, these announcements or, or the um, reminders that we have in our worship guide. They really are literally going on right now. So please reacquaint yourself with them. Ladies' Bible study is ongoing again. Men's Bible studies are going to continue. Uh, guys, th those that have been meeting with me in the mornings on Monday, 
I'm going to be out of pocket for the next couple of times we would meet. We're going to have to do something different. So for right now, if y'all would like to, just come to the group that meets at 5 o'clock tonight, and then you can just keep going with the men's Bible study uh, as a result of Man Church. All right? Well, lots going on, but all important. And none more important than our time of worship today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, our need for you in our lives and in our world is, is evident in so many ways. Uh, but we pray today that your activity in the world around us would start with me, would start with every single person uh, in this place. And Father, before we acknowledge the need of our, of our country or the nation's on our globe for you, we acknowledge our own need for you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would touch each of our hearts today and our minds. Help us, Father, as we consider what it means to, to dwell on the things that are true and the things that are honorable. We're grateful that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord Jesus and that you have provided the way, the only way to the Father. We're thankful, Lord, that your life and your death were the supreme acts and expressions of honor, even in the form of servanthood. We're grateful, Lord, for the glorious resurrection on the third day because of the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that we would trust in that same power today and every day. Lord, help us as we reach out and minister to the people around us. Pray, Lord, that we would see a harvest of souls that would come to know you as Lord and Savior. And we pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today as we worship, it's, uh, it's good to know that there's a place for us in our Father's house. Not just the house that he's building for us, but in this very house, there's a place for me to worship and, and to plug in and, 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 and to feel welcome. You know, there's so many places we go where, where we feel like an alien, but not here. This is just us. This is just family. Would you stand and sing and worship with us as we sing this song? Oh, 
God, today we just rest in you. You are the only one that's worthy of our praise. You're the only one that deserves it. And Lord, we've come to this place today to worship you. God, be with us through the rest of this service. Let us hear a word from the Lord as the blessed speaks his heart to us. God, just give us a great day of worship in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All God's people said. All right, everybody, let's take our copy of God's Word today. And if you would, turn to the New Testament, find the really small book of Philippians. Small in size, but ginormous in importance. As a matter of fact, when you get in just a few minutes, actually, it's a very small book. It doesn't take long to read, so I would encourage you Sometime very soon, maybe this afternoon, just before or after your Sunday nap, that's what you do on Sunday, just take a few minutes and sit outside, read this book, and you'll notice several of the verses that you either memorized sometime during your life or you hear repeated a lot, a lot of those verses disproportionately considering the size of the book, come from the book of Philippians. It's just an amazing book. In, in, in my life as a follower of Jesus, there are probably three books outside of the Gospels. There are probably three books of the Bible that I've, written, I've read more than any others. Those would be, be probably First and Second Timothy, because Paul wrote those to his young son in the faith who was a pastor. And especially as a young pastor, those books, along with the book of Titus, the, the pastoral letters, were especially encouraging to me. If there's one more book that's been the most encouraging to me over the years, it's the book of Philippians. If you're ever discouraged, or if you're ever down, um, if you're ever in despair, especially because of some circumstances that you're in, I would strongly encourage you to read Philippians. It's a book of joy. And also remember that as the Apostle Paul wrote it, he, he wrote it from a Roman prison in chains for the gospel. We'll read from, verse, from chapter 4 in a couple of minutes, but just as sort of an overarching theme to this next few weeks series of messages is going to be entitled dwell on these things because the latter part of one of these verses that we're looking at says just that to dwell as a follower of Jesus on these things and we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes but the reason is this the reason we're told to dwell on the things that we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks is because in every generation, every single one, there are cultural wars that are waged. Now, many people believe that those cultural wars are fought in the media. And many people believe that they're fought at the university campus. And some people believe that those cultural wars are fought in Washington, D.C., in our case, or at the ballot box. Can I just say respectfully that they are not? They're not fought in any of those places. In each generation, the real cultural battles are fought on the battleground of the human mind and heart. That's why there's so much in God's Word about the heart and about the mind. So I left my, I left my bag there. Paigey, can I have that please? The brown one. I think the other one might have a snack. That's for later. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I wanted to show you these, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in a few minutes. But these are exactly what they look like. It's just a, it's just a can of Coke and a can of Sprite. Both canned by the Coca-Cola Bottle Company. Been doing it for a long, long time. There's a real simple reason that there's Coke in this can and Sprite in this can. The reason there's Coke in this can and Sprite in this can is because the Coca-Cola company 
put Coke in this can. And the Coca-Cola company put Sprite in this can. All right? And what they put into these cans is what's in these cans. And I'll say it a different way. What they put in these cans is what dwells in these cans. And it's going to dwell in these cans until somebody pops them open and pours it out. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. The principle is what you put into your mind and what you put into your heart leads to who you become. Let that settle for just a second and think about the things that you put into your mind through conversations that you have and what you open your ears to, what you set your eyes on, maybe what you read, who or what you listen to. Those are all things that you, to a large degree, can control. So, Philippians 4, verse 8, Paul writes this. Finally, brethren. And by the way, when he says finally, this is not a matter of Paul's time of writing them, drawing to an end, and he's just kind of giving them a heads up, he's almost finished. It's way more than that. When he uses the word finally, as it's used here in this verse, what he, the message he's sending them is that he's taken everything that he's written before now, and we'll talk some about that in a minute, but he's taken all of the things that he's written before that, and he's saying, here's the bottom line. This is the takeaway. This is what all of that means. And so it was to cause his, his listeners, just in case they weren't paying full attention, to really lean in and pay attention to this part. And so we're going to do the same. So we lean in, and he says, the bottom line, brethren, finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And that's not the only verse. Maybe you've heard that verse before. As I said, the book of Philippians has so many of these golden nugget verses. But the next one is a part, say it's, it's a different thought, but it's a part of what I just read. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul writes... Don't just dwell on them. Don't just think about them. He says, practice these things. And then the result is, and the God of peace will be with you. So let's talk about what it means to dwell on these things. And this morning, we're going to take the first two, all right? They're not necessarily grouped this way, but we're going to see them this way because they do, the meanings of the words kind of overlap and feed off of one another. So if you have your notes there, there's three parts that you, we can break this, these verses down into. And the first one is the source of the truth and honor. And we're told who the source is really in the little greeting there by the Apostle Paul because he reminds us who he's writing to. Finally, brethren. Now, if I were a cynic and reading these verses, if I weren't a follower of Christ, I would read this and see these characteristics. Truth. Things that are honorable, right, pure, lovely, etc. And I would, and I could say, hey man, you don't have to be a Christian to have some of these character traits. You don't have to be a devoted follower of Christ to speak the truth or do a noble or an honorable deed. You know what? You and I could Google right now deeds of nobility and find hundreds. Some done by people who were followers of Christ and, and some not. But as Paul's going to describe these traits here, the prerequisite is these are for a follower of Jesus. So make no mistake, he's not just saying you need to be a person who tells the truth. There's something deeper going on here. Because the source of the truth he's talking about, the source of the honor that he's talking about, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we know that because he says, brethren. We also know it because Jesus is and was the personification 
of truth, literally. He said, I am the way, I am the truth. He didn't say, I just tell the truth or I represent the truth. He said, no, I am the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. And since Jesus was God in the flesh, we know that it's impossible for God to lie. And so Jesus was the personification of that truth. Here's an example. Now, this comes from the book of Hebrews. And the writer is just talking about the faith that Abraham had for God and why he could trust the word of God when God said, I'm going to prom- I'm make you a promise and your heirs a promise. And so the writer of Hebrews basically says that Abraham could trust God and believe God in that because God will never and can never lie. Here's how he says it. Hebrews 6.13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. That's kind of what people would do, you know, back in the day. They would, they would swear by a, a, a royal, or they would swear by, later on, they would swear by the temple or something in the temple. That's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. People should know you as a person of your word. And God said, surely I will bless you and multiply you to... Abram, And thus Abram, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, the two things are his nature and his word, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So when we dwell on these things, we'll talk about what that word means in a moment. When we dwell on them, one of the things that we dwell on is, or the source is the Lord Jesus Christ, the personification of truth himself. So the second part here is, again, just jot these in your notes if you want, not only the source of truth, but then the standard of truth and honor. So let's see what these are. Whatever is true. So what does he mean by true or truth? That might seem like a no-brainer to you, but I promise you it's a whole lot more complicated than that in our culture, in our world. In our context. And the reason that you can know that it's more complicated to that, at least to some people, is because of what they'll say about the truth. (laughs) I wish I had the words to express to you how really sick it makes me to hear somebody use the phrase, well, that's, that's their version of the truth. Or that's my version of the truth. Or for somebody to say, and they they think they're doing respectfully, they'll say, well, you know what? That's your truth. That is not my truth. Please know this. As a child of God in Christ, with Jesus being the source of our truth, this is probably why this is the first one that Paul mentions. There is no such thing as a person's version of the truth. Y'all with me? So when I hang on, because I, I heard somebody give this opinion and somebody give that opinion, and, you know, we respect both of the opinions. Okay, we can respect opinions. But that has nothing to do with the truth. The truth is about what really is. That's the context that's being used here, okay? So it's not a person's opinion. It's not a person's perspective. It's what is. And it might be that there are ten people discussing what is, and we might all be wrong. What is, is what's really taking place. For those of you that remember the old news anchor, the late news anchor, Walter Cronkite. Remember him? He had a way that he would sign off on his broadcast each evening. He would say, and that's, anybody remember? And that's the way it is. He would sign off that way. You you could never get away with that now. Because people would say, how arrogant for him to say that he knows the way that it is. Maybe it's not that way at all. Maybe I've got a difference of opinion. And And as silly as that sounds, there is no other version of the truth. The truth is the truth. Even if nobody knows it or nobody believes it. 
And that's the way it is. So, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12 reads like this. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech. He winks his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. And he says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And the first two are haughty eyes. That just means pride. But the second is a lying tongue. I heard somebody say one time that we're probably never more like the devil than when we're lying. And that's a strong statement, but it's because Jesus said when Satan lies, he speaks his native tongue. And Jesus himself is truth. And just as a footnote here, you can tell a lie without just coming out and contradicting what you know to be true. Sometimes lies take the form of exaggeration because just the facts or the truth maybe won't get the response or won't impress somebody like we really want, want to. You can say it with inflection or by not telling everything that happened, hoping the other person will believe something besides what actually did happen. So you, can, you might say, well, how, how can we really tell in our heart if we're telling the truth or not? Here's how. If you're intending to deceive someone, that's a lie. Well, y'all, it's really quiet in here right now. You notice that? Whatever's true. The second is whatever is honorable. Now, this is a, a really cool term. Translated, it just means, it can also mean whatever is noble. Some of you all probably got, anybody got a translation? Your Bible says whatever is noble. You could translate it that way too. Think of, think of a noble act. Another way of thinking of it is it's something that's worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. Now, here's the interesting thing about our culture, about our age. And there, it was really similar during Paul's time, too, in the first century. People in our culture, we could probably find some agreement that telling the truth is a good thing. Doing acts of nobility or, or acts of honor is a good thing when we see it. It's just that people usually don't go out of their way to dwell on these things. People don't go out of their way to do an act of honor or an act of nobility. Nobody thinks really badly of us if we don't. We just kind of honor those that do if we know about it. So why is this even here? It's because left to ourselves, we lower the bar. And that's why when you hear some politicians and they get caught in a lie if you're like most people you're like eh, man that's just what they do you ever think that or if you see or read about a, a pastor who gives in to temptation and is unfaithful you're like yeah that happens every once in a while or if a celebrity or an athlete does something provocative and self-serving, most of us are just like, yeah, man, that's just the world. And so here's the thing. It's, it's not that we don't admire these things when they're done. It's just that um, we don't strive for them. We, don't, we certainly don't dwell on them. Now, there are some reasons that the Apostle Paul says to dwell on these things for you and me. So it's not just so that we can know in our heart that we've done the right thing or even done the Christ-like thing. There's some reasons for this. You ever see or do you remember the report, a documentary on this now, do you remember a few years ago where the NBA official was charged and convicted of uh, really at least putting his thumb on the scales and affecting 
the outcome of some NBA games. And once they started, the FBI got involved, and, and once the FBI started doing some digging and investigating, a lot of information came out that even uh, exposed some NBA officials of persuading some of those officials to sway the outcomes of some of the games so that the series could be extended. And the lesson in that is that when power is involved and when money is involved, it's all the more tempting not to dwell on these things. And it's tempting, for, it's tempting for the follower of Jesus as well. And as really, as a result of kind of a current mindset in our own nation and really much of the world, we haven't dwelt on these things. What we dwell on is a down economy, some corrupt officials, negative information and coverage in media, and it makes people fearful and very, very negative about their future, even those that are followers of Jesus. And so the Bible, and, and in particular, what Paul is writing right here, certainly true the words of Jesus as well, that it is critical on what you and I allow in our minds and in our hearts. That's where the battle is fought and lost or won. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And I want to remind you what's going on as Paul is writing these things, just to see it in its right context, and then we're going to look at some lessons. Paul had had a a vision that really called him to leave his home, go to a different part of the world where you and I, roughly what you and I refer to now as Europe. And while he was there, he, he ministered there, he, he went to a, in fact, the first major city that he went to was, was Philippi, where the Philippians lived. And as he's there, he, he has a conversation with some ladies in that town, and, and they actually are saved and they become followers of Jesus and then they start the first little church in that part of the world and it began to grow so no wonder these people are so the Apostle Paul is very fond of these individuals not, not everything that happened in Philip Philippi was awesome like seeing people converted to Christ because um, on one of those occasions he was thrown into a Philippian jail and he was mistreated because of the gospel, and ultimately he was, he was released, but there was a lot of painful memories for Paul in this place too. Later on, he uh, is in the city of Jerusalem, and he's falsely accused of some things that went against their religious law, and he's arrested, and he appeals, to, ultimately he appeals to Caesar, and then he's taken to Rome, and that's where he's in chains for the gospel but he keeps corresponding back and forth to these people that lived in Philippi. And in order to help take care of Paul's needs, they sent someone to Rome to take a, a gift, a monetary gift to the Apostle Paul. The man's name was Epaphroditus. And somewhere in the trip, this man got very, very ill, and he almost died. And he recovered. And when he recovered, Paul sent him home to the Philippians but he said, I want you to take this letter to my friends there and thank them for me. And that's the letter of Philippians. And when he wrote to these people, he's writing back to a time now that there's, there's persecution. There was, there was a group of people that would follow the Apostle Paul and these Christians around wherever they would go. They were called Judaizers. And... You know, Jesus came, he said, not to abolish the old law, but to fulfill it. But they were going around saying that these Christians wanted to abolish their Jewish law. And so they said, well, you can follow Jesus if you want to, but now you still need to be circumcised, circumcise your males. You still need to follow all the Old Testament law and the tradition. 
And so the Apostle Paul wrote, still in this book, in chapter 3, verse 2, he wrote, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision, and worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Huh. No confidence in the flesh. There's a reason for that. Because for those of you that are listening, if you're, if you're listening or you're watching online, if you belong to the Lord Jesus, then you are to live in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and not rely upon the things of the flesh. And so you see, in their world, they were surrounded by all these lies around them and the things that are dishonorable around them by the people that the New Testament refers to as the Judaizers. And what Paul is doing in writing this letter and in this final conclusion, he's saying, listen, here's the bottom line. Don't dwell on all those things. Don't listen to all of those lies. Don't be pulled into all of those things that are going on around you. Instead, dwell on these things. Dwell on things of truth and things of honor. Now, here's the bottom line for you and for me. Ready? The preoccupations or the expectations of our culture are not the standard by which Christians are called to live. The expectations of our culture are not the standards by which Christians are called to live. This week, as I was still praying through this message and through that statement, it's one that I've repeated many times, and in some ways it's a core value. But I replaced a word for this morning because of the context of what we're sharing here, and so I'm going to give it to you. And instead of expectations, I would say preoccupations. Because our world, our culture, is preoccupied by some things and distracted by some things. And if you and I aren't careful, then we can be distracted by them too. Here's what they are. Here's just a few of the things that they are. The preoccupations of our culture. And these are not the standards by which we are to live. Our culture is preoccupied by conflict. Fear, wealth, influence, sexuality, and there are more, but those are most of the headlines. They dwell on those things. So finally, the final part is the strategy for dwelling on these things. So how in the world are you to do it when there are so many other things that are speaking into us? How do you dwell on these things? Well, Paul mentions that too in that second verse, in verse 9. First of all, he says, I want you to learn. And he says, learn, and you've learned them, you've received them, you've heard them and seen them in me. So learn about them. That word literally means to think about them. It's the same word that we get the word logical from. It means to not just think about it, but it means to consider it, to ponder it, to mull it over. I had a teacher one time that would say, she'd say something and then she'd say, now mull that over in your oatmeal tomorrow when you're eating it. And, I'm on, and I always say, I don't, eat, I don't eat oatmeal, so I do now, but I didn't back then. Your mind dwells on those things. It means to concentrate and to consider. It's the idea, again, in Philippians 2, 5, where Paul wrote, have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so back to, back to our, our, our props here. The reason that there's Coke in here is because it was put in here. The reason there's Sprite in here is because it was put in here. Never in the history of the Coca-Cola bottling company, never in the history of, of sugary carbonated drinks, okay, has Coke mysteriously and miraculously changed inside the can from Coke to Sprite. It's never happened. And it's never happened because the maker put something else in here and it's gonna stay in here and dwell in here until it comes out. So, for any, you know, maybe younger people, teenagers, folks that may be watching this or listening online as well, think about the information that goes into your head each day. 
the podcasts you listen to, the shows that you watch, the music that you listen to, and I know how that sounds coming from an old guy who's a preacher. I get it. That doesn't mean it's not true. Because what we put into our mind is what dwells there. And what we put into our heart is what dwells there. And for most of the rest of us that are saying, that's right, preacher, you tell them. Well, let's talk for another second. When you watch and listen to round-the-clock negative news, or you get caught up in a conversation over the phone or online or on a Facebook chat about who's seeing who and who's cheating on who and who's down in the muck and the filth of the junk in the world and you fill your mind negatively constantly with things that are designed to make you and me afraid by the way by professionals who get paid a lot of money to convince us that there is crisis after crisis after crisis. And I'm not in debate about some of the, the seriousness of all of that. Some of it is. But what I'm saying is, if you put that kind of stuff in your mind, in your heart, 24-7, without anything to offset it, without spending time with God, without spending time in God's Word, without being around God's people and the presence of other people that are filled and led by His Spirit, how do you think that's going to turn out? How can you dwell on these things if you're dwelling on those things? So Paul said, you learn about them. And he says, also, don't just learn about them, receive them. Col Colossians 2, 6 says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in them. And then he says, hear them. You've heard, you've heard them. Again, not just listened, not just learned, but you've really heard them. You've really let them sink in. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And can I just speak truth today and say that some of you have been absolutely listening to Satan about yourself, about your life, about your future, about your current condition. Please stop listening to him and listen to the voice of truth who loves you, who came for you, who died for you, and who is preparing a place for you if you trust in him. Jesus said, that thief, Satan, he just comes to take from you. I came that you might have life. And then the last thing Paul says is, the things that you have seen or observed in me. So be careful who you admire and who you revere and who you emulate and surround yourself by. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 says, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. And hey, it's true, Jesus hung out with the, the sinners, and he was around his disciples as well. But there's a difference in ministering to them and witnessing to them and being influenced by them. Okay, so why? Why is this such a big deal? Well, could it be that Jesus wants us to live in such a way? Look at the final verse, there's a clue there. These things you have seen and learned and received and heard, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, how does Jesus give peace? He gives us peace by providing faith and forgiveness, by our confession of our sin and our repentance and our faith in him. So could it be that God wants to use you and me in such a way he wants people to believe what we say about him. To, to, to understand that when we share the gospel with them, it's not because of anything that it's going to do for us necessarily, but it's an act of truth. And it's an act of honor and nobility to do those things. Let me just give you an example. 
Bill, if you care if I share this, forgive me. You can forgive me. I don't think you'll mind at all. But Bill Heaton, member of our church family, uh, had been in the hospital for quite a while, a few weeks, and he was even touch and go for a while. I mean, but Bill could have died through that time. And man, God spoke to him while he was there, and and the Lord's still doing some things in his life. And uh, but he was telling me the other day. It just, Bill, you were beaming. I don't, don't know if you knew that, but as you were sharing with me about your grass needing some attention as you were there next to your life, that seems like a small thing. But um, while Bill was there, there were a couple of members of the church that just went out there a couple times and just mowed his grass and cleaned up around there. Uh, that's just something that they could do for a, a brother and a sister in time of need. That's a noble act. There's not a lot of fanfare. They're not going to get a trophy for that. But that's an act of honor because they were serving a brother and a sister in the name of Jesus. Something they could do. But now just suppose, just suppose that Bill was not a follower of Christ. He certainly is, but just suppose he wasn't. And as I said, he could have died. So what if he ends up talking to, wanting to talk to some people that it was safe to have a conversation about eternity? about what happens when we die and leave this world. And he's thinking, who can I talk to? And there's really not a family member. I mean, it's a personal conversation. Don't know how it might turn out. But what if he knew that the friends that came and did that act of nobility were members of First Baptist Church? He would think, you know, I may not agree with what they say or what they stand for, but I think I can trust them. They've shown me a great deal of kindness. They've done a selfless thing to me, and you know what? I believe, here's the, here's the, watch this, I believe that they'll tell me the truth. So why do you think that Jesus wants us to be people who are people who speak the truth and serve people in an honorable or a noble way, it's so that other people could experience the peace of Christ that comes through the Prince of Peace. And if you want to know how you can have a credible witness, maybe how you can open the door to having some conversations with people who may not know Jesus, that's one of the ways you do it. Because people will talk about those kinds of things with folks they trust. And just to bring a full circle around to Jesus once again, listen, there's, there's never been anybody more truthful because he was truth. There's never been a greater act of honor and nobility than his act of sacrificing himself on the cross. So if you've never trusted him and received his peace in your mind and heart, then you can do so today. Let's pray together. Father, as we have this time of commitment, I pray that we would all, Lord, once again commit ourselves to be people of truth, people who can be trusted, people of our word. Thank you, Father, that you are truth and the way and life. So, Lord, I pray that you'll show us how we can practice these things and how we can best dwell on these things. And then we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together, please. Hey, if there's a public commitment or that you want to make today, I'll be down here for a few minutes. If you want to just come and have prayer about something, that'll be fine too. And we'll hang around after the service as well. But now's the time to just do some personal business between you and the Lord as we sing together.
Well, it's been great to have you in the house of the Lord today. I hope you have a great week. Take the love of Jesus with you. Share it with somebody that doesn't know it. That's our greatest gift to, to the world, isn't it? Have a great week. See you next time. <laughs>